Perfectly fine. So let's go ahead and get started. So uh, today we're going to talk about abiotic and biotic factors in biomes. Uh, today is Monday, October 22nd, 2018. I chose abiotic and biotic factors because looking at the activities for the unit of ecosystems, there's a lot of assignments that deal with abiotic and biotic factors. So I thought it'd be a, a good place to start. Okay, so um, the way this live session is gonna go is, uh, again, we're gonna talk about abiotic and biotic factors. Um, kind of run through a slideshow, hopefully about 15 minutes, maybe give or take a few. Uh, then go ahead and answer all of your questions and answers. Then we're going to talk about plagiarism and then uh, questions and answers over plagiarism, over anything uh, related to science so, or whatever else I can help you with. Okay, so things to remember. Uh, darn, sorry. Okay, so things to remember. Please participate. Um, it, this is for you. Uh, so go ahead and use this. Um, you can talk into your microphone or you can send me a chat. Also pay attention to surroundings. If it gets noisy, uh, please push mute on your microphone as uh, so it doesn't distract anyone else. Um, when we are discussing topics, please use kind words. If somebody has an opinion, uh, make sure that you are polite when dealing with that opinion. And then um, if you're not able to join us for the entire session, the live sessions will be recorded and then posted on your dashboard so you can look at them when you need to. Okay, so looking at our objectives from the ecosystem uh, unit, what is an ecosystem? I've got several um, examples of an ecosystem down on this slide, but we kind of need to know what an ecosystem is. Any thoughts? I would say um, it's where there is life. Good. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful start for sure. Yes, there is definitely lots of light. What else would we say about an ecosystem? Well, there's a, I would say that there is life and that it provides like for the life that's in, in, it's in there. Okay, I like it. Yes. So the, there is life and then there is life that's being supported. Is that kind of what you're saying? Correct. Okay, good. You've got half of it. <laughs> so an ecosystem, we can think of it as an organism. So one individual thing, other organisms, and the physical environment. And we're going to learn that the physical environment deals with both living and non-living. So you've got the living part. Just don't forget about the non-living. Yes. So organism, organisms that it interacts with and its physical uh, environment. Correct. Okay. So looking back at those pictures, what do we notice? That there's a, there, there, um, the weather, there's a weather difference. Like there's, they're completely different places. So okay. where there's mountains in one, there's, it looks like a pond in one. The other might be like a lake or a river. Okay. Good. So the climate's going to be different, uh, different settings. What else do we notice? We can see animals in one, we can't see animals in the other. Okay, good. So does an ecosystem have to have animals? No. Okay, good. That was my point. Exactly. So even though we can't see animals in uh, the mountain picture or the small pond, doesn't mean it's not an uh, ecosystem. There are still organisms living there. Awesome. And I like the fact that you brought in the weather. That's wonderful. 
Okay, so we noticed that one picture only had animals. So again, we talked about that not only being an uh, ecosystem. So we're gonna look back at our definition of an ecosystem. And we said that an, it was an organism and other organisms it interacts with and its physical environment. Well, what is an organism? We need to figure that out first. Okay, so here is an organism or several examples of an organism. So to fully understand what um, organism and biome really mean, we are going to look at the different levels of organizations and their meanings, okay? okay. Hello, Rachel. So these levels kind of break down the studying of a biosphere. They start from the simple and then they go all the way to the complex, okay? So the lowest, the simplest level is going to be an organism, and that's going to be one single living organism, whether it's a mayfly in the picture of the pond that we just saw or a single white-tailed deer. Those are all different organisms. Um, like the, the tree, the single tree, the single daisy, and the single snail. All of those are single living beings. Those are all organisms. So that's the simplest, the least complex in our level of organization. From organization, we go to population. Population is going to be our more complex level where we have multiple organisms that live and interbreed at the same place and time. So using our single organisms from the last slide, we now have a group of white-tailed deer. They're going to occupy the same time and place. We have a bunch of daisies that we can see are growing and occupying at the same time in the same place. And I thought the, uh, the population of snails that are on here are kind of funny that they're all lined up. But again, we had a single organism and we have developed into a population. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Feel free, if you have any questions, feel free to interject, okay? Um, so our next level is going to be a biological community. So a biological community is going to be a group of populations that live in the same place at the same time. So I couldn't find for obvious reasons, I couldn't find a, a picture of a real deer with a real bear, um, but we can picture these animals um, living together in the same community at the same place, at the same time. Um, tried to get a good shot of like a coral reef with all of its organisms and all of its populations. Um, just so you kind of get the idea, it's a group of populations living in one place at the same time. Okay, moving up from there, we have ecosystems. An ecosystem, again, that we talked, uh, flashing back to what we talked about earlier, can be thought of as an organism, the other organisms that it interacts with, as well as its physical environment. So for example, if we look at the shark picture, what, is, what are, what's the main organism? Let's start there. What's the main organism in that picture? In which one, I'm sorry? In the shark picture. That the shark would be the main organism. Uh, no, the, I would say the sea itself. Okay. All right, so then um, what organism would the sea, well, no. think no. about that. I don't know, remember what those are called. Okay, so um, remember when we're looking at the sea, we have to be, be careful. We have to be careful because water itself, is water a living or non-living thing? No, it's the coral. That's okay. what I was saying. <laughs> Good. Okay. Sounds much better. Okay. So 
the coral, we can see a whole ocean floor of coral. What would be an organism that the coral is interacting with? With the shark. Exactly, with the shark. And we can see that the physical environment is going to be within water, okay, within the salt water. Okay, going back to our lake picture, we can see uh, many birds, waterfowl, interacting with, unfortunately, maybe an alligator. Okay, that is going to be an ecosystem. We can see its physical environment being the tall weeds and the water around those two populations. Okay, does that make sense a little yeah. bit? Okay. All right. So now if you look to the right of your screen, we've got our little diagram. We've got an organism. The next level up is going to be population. Then we have biological community. Then we have ecosystem. And now we have biomes. So I know a couple of our um, assignments or activities deal with biomes. And biomes are going to be where a large group of ecosystems are going to share the same climate and occupy the same region. Okay, so we've got a couple different biomes here. Uh, we've got an example of the tundra and maybe like a rainforest right here. We've got lots of different ecosystems in each of these pictures. They all have the same climate and they're occupying the same region. We'll talk more about biomes in a little bit. Okay, and then the biosphere, that is our planet, basically. It's going to be the regions of our atmosphere, hydrosphere, and our lithosphere of the Earth all supports life. So it's going to be the air that we breathe, the water that uh, makes up our planet, and the land. That everything that supports life will be considered a biosphere. And that, again, is the most complex, most um, difficult level to study if you don't start with the basics, starting with the organisms first. Questions so far? None for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's review. We just went over the different levels of um, organization. So let's think back. How does an organism relate to, a, to the biosphere? And I'll go back so we can look at that diagram again. So again, how does an organism relate to a biosphere? What are your thoughts? The relationship would be life for me, I don't know. Okay, yeah, definitely, because we talked about how a biosphere supports life, good. And, and the other reason is life, I guess. I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch the beginning of that. Um, what was that? It's, uh, the, it supports life and the organism itself, it, it's life, so. Okay. Okay, I see. So um, since the biosphere supports life, we learn that the organism is a living individual. Okay, very good. So again, starting at a single individual organism, a, a living being, we have grown to a whole planet that supports that one organism basically supports life. Good. Awesome. Okay. So now we're going to continue that objective in our ecosystem unit and differentiate between biotic and abiotic factors. So we're going to fill in the blank in a couple of these slides. So the blank living or oh, oops, <laughs> the blank things in an organism's environment are called biotic factors. How would we fill in the blank? You said living. I know I did. <laughs> So, the living things in an organism's environment are called biotic factors. Right. So, a biotic factor is going to be any living component that affects another organism or its ecosystem. Okay, so different um, examples here. We've got uh, some fungus growing on the side of a tree. I see two biotic factors 
affecting each other and their ecosystem. Okay, how would you explain uh, Nemo's picture as an example of biotic factors? Nemo and the coral, they're two living organisms and Let's say. Yeah, and they're, they're affecting uh, each other's ecosystem for sure, okay? So if we, we need to remember that biotic equals living, like uh, biology is a study of living organisms, biotic equals living, okay? And then abiotic, the blank factors in an organism's environment are called abiotic factors. Non-living. Non-living, exactly. So it's just the opposite of our biotic factors. Okay, so these are the non-living chemical and physical parts of the environment. And to me, learning abiotic factors was hard to think of the chemical side of things. Um, all the elements that we are breathing in. Um, the chemistry in the air that we breathe. So it's taking our physical and our chemical environment and it's affecting those organisms. So example would be a sun or the sun uh, and the water that surrounds us. Rainfall is going to be um, a abiotic factor. The, um, the air that we breathe, again, is going to be abiotic. Okay, so again, abiotic equals non-living. So the rocks, um, the floor, the chair that I'm sitting on is affecting my current environment. Okay, um, the computer that we're looking at is affecting our current environment. And those are all abiotic factors. Okay, some examples of some, again, abiotic factors that we tend to overlook when we are talking about an ecosystem. Uh, obviously the sunlight's gonna be important. We have rain or just precipitation in general. Uh, snowfall is pretty important to certain parts of the world. Wind, water, and soil. So those are all abiotic factors. I know this picture is a little blurry, but I really liked it because it broke apart the ecosystem into, into biotic and abiotic factors. So on the upper left-hand side, you can see the biotic factors, which would be what? The animals. Okay, we see, we see animals. We see what looks like a moose, maybe a rabbit, uh, some type of bird. We also see the evergreens and the grasses that they're standing on. So those are all living organisms. Those are all the biotic factors of this ecosystem. And then if we look on the right side, we're gonna see all the abiotic factors taken out of that ecosystem. What do we see there? The water on the ecosystem? Uh, the abiotic factors. There's no, there's no life in it, so it's water, rocks. Um. Very good, very good. I, I like that you just uh, pointed out that there's no life in that. Excellent, there's, there's nothing there. Um, the mountains, those are not living. Um, the grass was all removed. Um, the, there's rocks. Again, there's water, but there's nothing else living. I like that. There's no life there. Okay, and then when we put those both together, that's when we get the ecosystem as a whole. Okay, talking about biomes. Um, this is where the abiotic factors are going to come into play when talking about the different biomes. So, the abiotic factors are going to vary across the biosphere. Remember, the bi biosphere is the entire planet and are dependent on the survival of all organisms. Organisms that live in the same region or biome are going to depend on the same abiotic factors. And biomes 
normally are characterized by abiotic factors such as the temperature and the precipitation or lack thereof. Okay, there are five major biomes. When you look up biomes, you're going to get a ton of information, but all the extra biomes are broken down from these five main biomes. So we have the aquatic biome, forest biome, desert biome, grassland biome, and tundra. Starting with the aquatic biome, this is the world, the Earth's largest biome. Uh, since 75% of the Earth is covered with water, it only stands to make sense. Whether it's salt water or fresh water, there is a ton of water, so it stands to reason that that's going to be the largest. We can separate this large biome into fresh water and salt water, or sometimes salt water is called marine. Fresh water are going to be your ponds, your lakes, your rivers, okay? And then the marine or salt, later, salt water are gonna be your ocean or your estuaries, okay? Um, the water temperature between all these different aquatic biomes are going to vary. However, they tend to be humid and their temperatures are going to be on the cooler side, give or take. You know, some in the Amazon probably aren't going to be super cold, but um, Lake Superior is typically cold. So it's going to be dependent on where you are. Okay, forest biomes are going to make about one third of the Earth's land. I thought this was interesting that they account for over two thirds of the leaf area and they contain about 70% of the carbon present in living things. That is, you know, through learning about photosynthesis, we know that carbon is important, um, but I just thought it was very interesting that it was that um, intense. So we have three different categories of forest biomes. We've got the temperate, which is going to be in the middle, okay? We've got the um, boreal, which is going to be um, this one, and then we've got the tropical or the rainforest, okay? And, oops, sorry. The differences between the forests are going to be based on the type of plants, temperature, and rainfall. Obviously, the rainforest is going to receive a lot more rainfall. Um, in terms of types of plants, what do you notice between these three pictures? They're different plants. Yeah, they, they are different. Um, the temperate forest, the one right in the middle, is going to be our deciduous trees. Those are the small leaf trees that are changing colors outside right now. Um, and then the boreal forest on the right side is going to be our evergreens, where they typically don't lose their leaves. So, um, and this is not saying that there are not going to be evergreens in the temperate forest or um, maybe a few uh, deciduous trees in the uh, boreal forest, but ma the majority are going to be those different types. Okay, the desert. Again, the desert is going to cover one fifth of the Earth's surface. And to be classified as a desert, it has to receive less than 50 centimeters of, of oh, 50 centimeters of rain a year. Most deserts are found in the low latitudes, um, pretty warm areas. They have a considerable amount of vegetation and animals that are very specialized. So when we go to the desert, we find uh, cacti. Those are specialized to retain water. Um, we have different um, reptiles that are specialized for the heat. Um, we have certain mammals that can withstand the heat, so they're very specialized. 
Uh, this large biome, we have four different types. We have a hot and dry desert. We have a semi-arid, a cool, and a coastal. So uh, the one on the lower right hand is going to be our coastal desert. Our cool desert is going to be on the lower left hand with the uh, mountains. And then the semi-arid is going to be up at the top of the right hand side. And hot and dry is typically what we think of when we think of a desert with all you can see is sand. At least that's what I think of when I think of deserts. Any questions so far? Not for me. All right, so we have grasslands next. Um, this area is going to be characterized by um, low grasses uh, rather than large trees and shrubs. Um, every once in a while, like in the picture, you can see a large tree, but it's not highly wooded like our forests. We have two main types. We have the grasslands or savannas and then the temperate grasslands. Um, in the picture with the single tree, that's going to be your savanna where you're gonna see the lions and the elephants and the giraffes. And then um, the lower left hand, you see a, bu a, bu ugh, a bunch of sagebrush and low grasses. You also see a lot of kind of sand because of it being so dry. Then the tundra, um, the tundra is going to be our coldest biome. Uh, it has extremely low temperatures, little precipitation, very poor nutrients, and a short growing season. So in the tundra, you see lots of small grasses and short shrubs because of such a short growing season. Large trees can't grow. Um, we have an alpine tundra and an arctic tundra. Obviously, the alpine is going to be where we have the um, mountain sheep or goats. Um, and then we have our Arctic, which is covered in snow. Okay, any questions over that section of the presentation? Not for me. Okay. All right, so we'll go over the activity 6.2.1. Again, it was entitled Abiotic and Biotic Factors and Biomes. So the first question was, a tree is a biotic factor in an ecosystem. Would that be true or false? True. True, why? Because a tree is le it's, it's living. Right. In one of our activities, it asked, um, how can you tell a tree is living even if it doesn't move. Have you done that activity yet? I have not yet. Oh, okay. So how can we tell a tree is a biotic factor and is living when it doesn't move? What do you think about that? I couldn't tell you if it was in a picture, but if I was, <laughs> if I was able to touch it, I mean, if it's dry and uh, it, that's, if the tree is dry, I would say there's completely dry, I would say there's no life in it. Okay. Okay, so um, you could look at um, the leaves. If the leaves were green, it's still um, doing some photosynthesis. Um, if it's all dry, the leaves are brown, crumbly, then you're right, there's no life in that. Um, so the tree is a biotic factor in an ecosystem that is definitely true. And even though a tree doesn't move, think of what a tree does do to show us that it's alive. Um, besides using touch. What do you think? Well, the tree produces it depends on what kind of tree it is, but it normally trees produce, not all the time, but 
I mean, some might have fruit. Um, You're, yes, some might have fruit. Um, some uh, produce pine cones. Some produce acorns. Um, those are all like uh, seeds, a way to reproduce. So excellent. That would be a good answer for that question. <laughs> okay, number two, abiotic factors are once living, non-living, alive, living. Non-living. Very good. Abiotic factors are non-living. Excellent. Okay, blank are major types of ecosystems that occupy broad geographic regions. Habitats, biomes, populations, or communities. Biomes. Very good, exactly. Remember, biomes are the um, Play, um, biomes are the level of organization that uh, encompasses different regions. Okay, so like um, the whole, let's say, um, okay, Greenland. Greenland is a geographic region. However, it's over under one biome. Okay, so it's going to be one of the, the tundras, probably an alpine tundra, because it's all in one region. Okay, sorry, this didn't copy and paste very well. Um, number four, match the correct biome with its characteristics. So we have uh, the five major, tun um, five major biomes that we went over, as well as some characteristics. So looking at A, which of the five biomes is dominated by trees? B. Well, one, two, three, four, or five. Oh, oh, you're talking, wait, I was going on one. I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, that's I'm okay. Gonna... You want to do it that way? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so used to it. I'm so sorry. No, um, we can, dom we can. Dominated, we can. I will do it. Dominated by trees is forest. Okay, very good. Sorry about the confusion. Okay, so yes, the forest is gonna be domi dominated by trees. Okay, if we look at B, limited vegetation due to low temperatures and a short growing season would be? One. One, or tundra. Okay, letter C is going to be matched up with which biome? Limited vegetation due to low precipitation. Four. Or, or desert, excellent. Uh, the largest group of biomes can be fresh or salt water. Two. Aquatic and then dominated by grasses. Be the grassland. Very good, excellent. And then um, number five, an abiotic factor in an ecosystem is temperature, precipitation, climate, or all of the above. All of the above. Excellent, very good. Again, some of the things that are overlooked when we're looking at an ecosystem, um, you don't think of the temperature or the precipitation or climate affecting, but it's definitely important. And number six, which of the following are biotic factors? Temperature, vegetation, soil, wind, and humidity. Biotic factor. Which one um, of those is living? The only one I, I would say would be vegetation, but. And you're absolutely correct. Yes, vegetation. Vegetation, what is vegetation? When I think of vegetation, I think of like where I plant my vegetables or, you know, <laughs> and <Yeah. plant. laughs> That's excellent. Exactly. Your garden is full of vegetation. Um, the grasses outside are full of vegetation. Exactly. When I think of vegetation, I think of plants. So it's excellent. Okay. Okay. So let's focus on, let's, Let's stop on this slide for a minute. 
why do you think biomes were in the same unit as abiotic and biotic factors? Why do you think they're so important and linked to each other? I believe that the biomes determine what abiotic and bi biotic factors are going to be. You know, if we tend to, if we were to see pictures of different biomes, we would probably see the same type of like living and non-living organisms um, because that's what those rely on, I would say that like the for in the forest, we would find, you know, certain animals. That's how, that's how I link them together. Yes, you are right on. Yes, for sure. Um, we talked about the desert being full of specialized organisms. I feel like all the biomes are kind of specialized because there's no way you're going to take a forest uh, animal, let's say a raccoon, and put that raccoon in a desert. Is a raccoon going to survive? Mm. Probably not. Okay, so the, the raccoon relies on the temperature of the forest, the climate of the forest. And when it's super hot in the desert and there's no precipitation, the raccoon's not going to make it. Okay, um, if we take a maple tree and put it in the Arctic tundra, probably not going to survive because it's not used to those abiotic factors such as the extreme temperature and the climate. Okay, good. All right, so the next part of our presentation is going to be on plagiarism. And a lot of people don't realize how important and detrimental plagiarism can be. Okay, so um, according to the online dictionary, to plagiarize means to steal or pass off ideas or words of another, um, to use another's production without citing the source, to commit literal theft, and to present as new and original an idea or product. So to get my point across, I was actually, I copied and pasted these from the plagiarism.org website. However, those are, these are not my thoughts. These are not my words. Um, so I had to put quotes around them and to cite my source, okay? Um, they also said that in other words, uh, plagiarism is an act of fraud. Uh, you're stealing somebody's work and you are basically lying about it afterward. Um, some examples, again, I copied and pasted this straight from the uh, website to prove my point. Um, however, if I were to have forgotten the website and forgotten the quotes, then um, I could have gotten into some trouble. Um, so consider plagiarism turning in someone else's work as your own. If you have a sibling do your activities for you, um, that could be considered plagiarism. Um, uh, copying the words or ideas from someone else without giving credit. Um, basically just copying and pasting off the internet without um, giving credit is going to be uh, plagiarism. Failing to put a quotation in quotation marks. Uh, giving incorrect information about the source, changing words but copying the sentence, and copying so many words or ideas from the source that it makes up the majority of your work, um, whether you give it credit or not. Um, again, it can be plagiarism when you're just using a, a picture or a video or a piece of music. Um, that is also plagiarism. I found this um, interesting uh, movie or a little video that kind of uh, puts it into perspective. So let's um, watch this. Hello, my name is Professor Andrew Young. And today we'll be discussing plagiarism in two lessons. The first lesson will focus on what is plagiarism, while the second lesson will address how to avoid plagiarism. But first, what is plagiarism? According to Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, 
plagiarism is the act of using another person's words or ideas without giving credit to that person. The key phrase in Webster's definition is without giving credit. Giving credit is imperative. So you may be thinking, okay, okay, but why is it important to avoid plagiarism? If I like those words and I agree with them, can I just those? It can't be that big of a deal, right? But the short answer, plagiarism is a big deal. Before I explain the academic consequences of plagiarism, let me give you a musical example that illustrates the seriousness of plagiarism. Take a listen to this song by Marvin Gaye titled Got to Give It Up, which was released in 1977. Now, listen to this song titled Blur Lines which was released in 2013 by Robin Thicke, featuring Pharrell Williams and T.I. Everybody get up. <laughs> Notice any similarities between the two songs? Marvin Gaye's family did. In fact, Robin Thicke was accused of plagiarism by the Marvin Gaye estate, which provided significant evidence against Thicke's blurred lines. And the Rolling Stone reported that Thicke and company had to pay out a whopping $7.3 million to Marvin Gaye's estate for plagiarism. So what about plagiarism in academia? You'll probably not owe millions of dollars nor go to jail. However, plagiarism is still a very serious offense. For instance, the State College of Jacksonville policy states that the student rights and responsibilities under the heading procedures for handling alleged academic dishonesty. Academic dishonesty in any form is expressly prohibited by the rules of the District Board of Trustees of Florida State College at Jacksonville. The consequences can include either failing the student for the assignment, failing the student for the course, or referring the student or students for possible suspension or dismissal. So it is very serious indeed. So how can we avoid those blurred lines of plagiarism and original thought? First, it is key to understand the assignment and its expectation. For instance, if professors in social sciences or nursing or business, um, those professors often prefer a style called APA. Professors in the liberal arts humanities often prefer MLA. There are other citation styles, so you wanna make sure you format your citation according to your audience. If your professor doesn't state specifically, be sure to ask. For this presentation, I'll be focusing on MLA, which stands for Modern Language Association. So what constitutes plagiarism? Some of the more obvious examples include buying an essay from a website like payforessays.net or freshessays.com. Another example would be letting your mom or dad or boyfriend, girlfriend, friend, neighbor write the essay for you. But if you do write an essay, rather than trying to dishonestly farm it out, you want to make sure that you aren't committing these acts of plagiarism. Copying information word for word, also known as verbatim, directly from the source without giving credit. Okay, that is egregious. That's equally as bad. Um, or, and many students are unaware of this, if you paraphrase, which is putting the information in your own words from a book or website, but you do not give credit to the book or website, that is still plagiarism. Why, you may be wondering? It's plagiarism because it's not your ideas. Sure, you may agree with those ideas, but it's important to give the writer credit for those ideas. So how do you avoid plagiarizing a source? In order to document a source in MLA format, there are two essential ingredients. The first is called a works cited page. And each source will have what's called a works cited entry that's organized in alphabetical order. And then there is a corresponding in-text citation, also called parenthetical citation in your essay. These two parts work together like a cross-referencing system. So when your professor reads your essay and encounters a citation within the essay, he or she can go to the end of the essay and read the works cited page, which lists all of your sources in order to locate the source. 
In short, in order to document, you need a complete citation in a works cited page and an in-text citation of the source within your paper. Both are required in order to provide full credit to the source. In the next videos, we'll be discussing how to write a works cited page and how to effectively use in-text citations, whether you're using direct quotes, paraphrase information, or signal phrases, also called an attribution. And this is the end of the first lesson on plagiarism. So I, we're not going to worry about a works cited page or insights um, citations. However, I just thought that it was very important to see that even if we are copying and pasting straight from the uh, internet without giving correct cite, uh, um, um, yes, without properly citing, we can get in trouble for that. Um, pictures, um, those are all, those all need to be um, properly cited. Um, so what happens here? Um, okay. All right, so next slide are some of our policies. So your first offense on an assignment or an activity, you're going to receive a 1% you need to talk to the teacher or the academic coach to redo the assignment and your academic coach and your principal will definitely be notified um, if you um, choose to plagiarize again it's going to be the same as your first offense so you have you will receive a one percent you um your activity or i'm sorry your academic coach and your principal will be notified but you will not be able to redo the assignment. And then um, for the final, you will receive 1% one, uh, 1 again. Your academic coach and your principal will be notified and you will have to take the entire class again. Uh, pretty major um, because you've spent a lot of time on your class and it's definitely frustrating to have it gone um, that quickly. Um, always read the directions for all of your assignments. Um, make sure that you read to know what you can and can't have um, in order to prevent plagiarism. Okay. Um, any questions about this presentation? Sorry, I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Don't apologize for thinking, by the way. That's that's a good thing. <laughs> Maybe any questions about any other activities? I do. I do have questions that I would like to send to you. Um, however, I'm okay. not on it now, so you probably get those tomorrow because I know I've been um, so I do have questions. I just don't have those about the other ones now. Okay. Um, I'd love to get them tomorrow or even this evening. Thank you. Um, but no, no, no other questions on, on this. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me. It was uh, an honor to spend this time with you and thank you for participating. I learned a lot in this, in this lesson. So I'm, I'm very happy that I was able to make and I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that too. And get with me so I know all of your other questions, okay? All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.